Hi there, I'm Dan Jones, editor at Light Reading. I'm here in Barcelona at Mobile World Congress for Orb TV. And uh, my colleague Steve Bell from uh, our heavy reading division, um, we're talking about IoT. Oh, we are. It's yes. fun. Yes. You can't walk around the show without seeing it. Right. And what, what have you learned from... You, I, you sound like you've been wandering around the show quite a bit. So what have you learned? Um, obviously, the, the, you know, all of the big vendors are, are talking about IoT. Um, and there's lots of smaller devices emerging. Um, I mean, there's a great exhibition up in Hall 8 where you're starting to see lots of different applications. But when you go onto the major stands, it's still about smart city. It's still about industrial IoT. Um, and it's about healthcare to a degree, but mm -hmm. that's, always, that's proving difficult. Um, and connected car. The, uh, the thing that everybody is saying though is that there's 90% of what's out there at the moment is proof of concept stuff. And although some of it is moving to contract, not much has really moved into that sort of commercial monetized solution. Smart meters is probably about mm -hmm. one of the only ones that's really sort of, you know, and that's been because it's been driven in different markets, you know, like for instance, China, where it's still man mandated. Um, mm -hmm. There are difficulties. Smart cities is, is difficult because of the fact that the, you've got silos. Um, right. And, and the, the, the other thing is that the network, op, network providers are saying that the, the, net, the network operators have got their own problems in terms of you know, they're used to selling to um, consumers. Mm -hmm. and, and this whole concept of selling long time sale solutions to silos within companies and silos within governments is is causing them problems. Right, it's, it so. seems like they're still trying to figure out at least how to price that and right. uh, many other things. Now, uh, there's been quite a bit of talk about kind of big data and big data analytics here as well. Will that, will that big data analytics change the way that IoT is approached and done over time? Again, when, when you look at what, what's being said, connectivity, you can't, you're not going to make any mm. money. Um, and so there has to be this transition to analytics or value-add services. And the value-add services, at the end of the day, get generated when you can take that data, analyze it, and, and use, utilize different intelligence to come up with, with solutions or come up with um, services. Um, so a lot of the um, you know the vendors are talking about AI on their platforms and adding it in as a module so you've got big data and AI um, <clears throat> and one of the issues obviously is that maybe the Telefonicas and the you know AT&T's and the Verizon's can afford to have their own data scientists but right. you know the other 700 plus you know smaller operators are not going to go out and, and sort of you know suddenly hire bunches of data scientists so the, the uh, ability to create modules or to create solutions and to offer that as part of a integrated platform a, a cloud platform a, a, as a service is certainly something that a lot of the, um, the vendors are, are sort of looking to provide to help the accelerate the process for IoT adoption so. right right and of course uh the big shining hope on the hill for IoT and many other things is 5G. I mean, how do you think that's going to change IoT? So it's kind of interesting because because they can't. You know, there's a there's a lot of hype, and we mm -hmm. you know, we we tend to try and burst the bubble. But 5G and IoT it seems to be mentioned the whole time. Right, and, you can't really say one without the right, other. Right, it's machine machine type technologies. You know, massive type communications. Um, and you know the, the challenge that you're faced with is you've got narrowband IOT going in now. Yep. They're just you know there's like 40 networks I think have gone in something mm -hmm. like that of the GSMA so so they're only just starting to get that. And as I said earlier, it's still proof of concepts and and sort of getting the not really at the commercialization. So how do you go from there to saying you know like Ericsson proudly said it's going to be between 200 and 600 billion dollars worth of revenue by 2025? I mean right. there's a big roadmap between those two. Having said that though, I was on the Qualcomm stand mm. and they've got the connected car there and I was talking to their um, their VP of uh, connected cars 
And the interesting point that he made was that because the car companies have to plan their, their platforms early. It's like five years ahead. Five, right? At least five years. He's had really quite advanced conversations mm -hmm. with the car manufacturers to the point where he's saying he believes that, that the car manufacturers will have cars enabled with 5G by 2020. Oh, wow. And uh, if you think about that, you think, well, China is one of the largest, fastest growing markets. The US is a large market as well. Mm -hmm. And those two markets are right now are the, are the arms race between who gets there first and, and who rolls it out. So, and the, the advantage of the connected car as a platform is it's got loads of power, loads of, loads sure. of room, and lots of opportunity for but they're also incorporating it with the whole cellular V2X yep. aspect as well. So, and as this starts to drive down the cost element, then you know roadside units, which you know facilitate the intelligent transport system, so vehicle to infrastructure, vehicle to pedestrians, vehicle to vehicle, the smart city takes on a whole different dimension. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, you know, our traditional mindset, you know, we've been in the industry long enough down mm -hmm. there, it's like, when's the, when's the first dongle gonna be there? When's the first, you know, right. phone? It may be that it's actually a different paradigm. It's actually gonna be large, large unit platforms with, with 5G incorporated. That, I mean, that makes sense in terms of battery life and some of the connectivity <laughs> yeah. issues. But um, I mean, uh, that's quite an aggressive timeline. You could easily see that people would be driving around in a connected car with nothing to connect to in some places in the US and, and China on, on a 2020 timeline. Yeah, but, but let's think about the fact that you know if you had uh, a shared car service, for instance, in in a city, right? You know, so you, you know Daimler, Audi, they're all looking at, at sort of you know mobility is their is their future. It's not selling cars; it's, mm -hmm. it's selling mobility. So if their vehicles were connected with five G and provided new types of services for their customers, and you know cities are likely to be the the first rollout area for yeah, yeah. a lot of 5G. I can see how that could play out. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so there's this some new models and some new thinking, mm -hmm. which I think is refreshing, because we tend to be a bit cynical about yeah. this stuff. So, uh, so that, was, that was probably the most eye-opening thing for me. Cool. <laughs> All right, well, there's quite a bit to think about there. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Thanks man. man. Cheers. All right, uh, and I'm Dan Jones again for uh, Light Reading and Old TV.